what do you look for when hiring? Yeah, that's a good broad question. I look for great software writers. <laughs> that's the at least when I'm hiring for for a software writer position. And how do you actually figure that out? Well, there's mm-hmm. a bunch of indicators that you could use. You could try to think, oh, did they go for an Ivy League education? Did they work at a prestigious firm? Did they do all these other things? And I found that those indicators are not very helpful at all. (laughs) Um, And not only do they produce duds, but they produce tons of false negatives that many of the very best programmers in the world are autodidacts, that they learn programming themselves, Mm -hmm. not through any accredited school. They just figured that out and, and got good, right? So how do you get those people into the into your sites if all you're looking for are these secondary concerns. Well, for us, it's been a lot about looking at the code. Um, I mean, I, I'd say that a lot of programmers just self-select themselves out of the pool. We, we, for any programming job, we get maybe somewhere between 100 and 150 applications. Okay. I'd say that a good 80 to 90, of, well, at least 80% of those are rejected outright because people just spam us with a resume. Like, hey, right. places I've worked and this is the year I graduated. And I go like, what the fuck? Like, how's this actionable information? Like, what am I going to use that for? <laughs> I think resumes <laughs> in, a, in a general sense are pretty worthless when they come to assessing the capabilities of programmers. So I pay very little attention to them. They're heavily discounted, let's put it like that. And then the other fact is that then they write a cover letter that's just generic, right? I, I get where that all comes from. Like, uh, maybe you've had a couple of rejections and you don't want to put a bunch of time into making one application. Well... I think that's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like um, sending out a bunch of applications that are just your resume and a, and a generic cover letter. Mm, and I don't know how many people are going to get excited about that. Mm-hmm. I certainly wasn't, right? And we were lucky enough that even if 80% of the applications we get fall, fail that test, that still leaves 20% that, that pass it. So from the 20% that passes, which is basically people who write us a, a good cover letter um, that demonstrates some knowledge and interest in our specific company and organization and tools that right, we're using. Okay. Um, they make it through the first pass, right? But after that, I just I try to look at code. I found that um, I very quickly can form an opinion if I see a substantial body of work from someone on their skill set. Some of the things are rudimentary in terms of how do you care about the the presentation of your code um i'm i'm not a stickler for like oh you made a comma error or you made a spelling error in your cover letter and that immediately puts you out of the pool of course it doesn't that's completely foolish i fucking make spelling mistakes all day long (laughs) tweets that go out to to 140,000 people right so (laughs) i'm not going to put myself on the pedestal here but there is a point where there's a tipping point where it establishes a pattern. Like this person is just not diligent enough with the quality of the code that this is something that fits what we're looking for. Sure. Uh, And a lot of people fail that test. A lot of the code is just like poorly indented, poorly named, poorly scoped. Um, I mean, it sort of ratchets us up from there, right? Like the, some of the code, if it's already poorly indented and like it's full of things that are commented out or whatever, you just go like, really? Like, if are you looking at things guess- on GitHub, for example? Yeah. Like just out of random? Okay, not random. People usually submit this. this oh, is, this wow! Is what gets me too, right? No that way. Somebody would submit a a piece of code and like they just wouldn't clean it up. It's kind of like you're inviting. Uh, your prospective employer over to your house and you didn't fucking even clean up. <laughs> like there's right, just, that's like, weird. Last night and like all sorts of crap all over the floor and you just go like, <laughs> okay, I mean, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means like put some fucking diligence into this stuff, right? Like um, you don't have to impress me like it's the Pope coming over for dinner, but <laughs> could at least just do a, a minimum to clean up the mess. Mm-hmm. So... There's that, but then it's even beyond that because there's also plenty of applications that, like, they are clean and they are well prepared. They're just not that great code. Mm -hmm. And that is the unfortunate thing where a lot of people are then unsatisfied with that assessment, right? Like, what do you mean bad code? Can you tell me exactly what you mean? It's kind of like sending somebody a, uh, an essay, right? Like a short story. And, like, you just go, like, ah, I didn't really like that story. And they go, like, what do you mean? Point to the line, the paragraph that's bad fix it and you just go like yeah well i mean i can't teach you how to write a short story that's mm-hmm. interesting in like an email i can't teach you how to be a 
good programmer in a reply to your job application. Mm -hmm. It just, and that's, it's a shitty response in some ways, right? Because how is it actionable just to tell somebody like, hey, your code is not that good. Um, but that's the, that's usually just the, the underlying fact. And some of it is just, I think at this point, at least in my perception of things, is, is sort of base level stuff, like um, that your methods are just not composed, like they're 15 lines long and they do five different things and like uh, tons of local variables and all sorts of other mm. setups where you just go like, yeah, I don't know. Um, so I think to avoid falling into the trap, I, at one point I wrote up a blog post, like so the five books that influenced me the most. And one yes. of those books that I, I find particularly pertinent to this like if you could just sort of try to internalize the lessons of uh, small talk best practices those are a lot of sort of the base level it's kind of like a on writing well for programming which is this uh book by william sinsner i think is his name about uh writing well in prose um well small talk best practices for me at least is that kind of book for programming okay. it's very nitty-gritty it goes into just all the elements of uh proper naming, proper composition, and so forth. And uh, if you've read that and practiced that, I think you're going to take a big step forward in your mm -hmm. career um, and have a much higher chance of, uh, if you apply at a place like Basecamp to mm -hmm. get to, yeah. to a point where I think like, oh, wow, this is interesting. I want to see more. I want to learn more. I want to know some more. Well, for us, then, the final step is if you make it through that, we have to write, make you write some code for us. So... The only way you, you can sort of sidestep that is if you already have a big body of work in the open source community, like we've hired a number of people straight out of the mm -hmm. Rails core group or otherwise associated with Rails because I had already been working on them or with them for a bunch of time on, on real code. If, if that's not the case, and that's certainly no um, disqualifier, you don't have to have open source contributions at all to, to work at a place like Basecamp, but I do have to work with you on code. Um, so if that doesn't come through the open source world, then we sometimes do this where we do a test. So we pay someone to basically do a, a side project for us and they can work nights or weekends or whatever. Um, we pay them for, for the time to do it. It's not a big project, but it just gets us to, to sit down and work that out. And once you go through that process with a couple of candidates, it's usually very clear who you mm -hmm. want to hire. Mm -hmm. You get to see how they work and the thought yeah, process behind it. Work, see how they think, see how they solve projects, see yeah. how they write code when it's them faced with a new situation sure instead of having them write on a whiteboard on the spot or something like that yeah, yeah that is the worst thing ever <laughs> yeah i've railed against this uh frequently and you can't rail against it frequently enough uh, artificial coding sessions at the whiteboards are the devil and yeah. companies that follow them deserve the kind of candidates that they get <laughs> um it's just a terrible terrible way of uh subjecting people to an extremely stressful situation um yeah. an unnatural situation where they don't have their workspace they don't have their tools and like if you have pulled me out and made me write uh, what bubble sort or something on the yeah. <laughs> whiteboard like i'd probably fail that miserably yeah. and i just think about like hey i would uh, fail the majority of these right on a whiteboard tests so to think that I, I can get something good out of using those uh, mm. tricks and techniques is, is just fully folly. If you enjoyed this short clip, you're probably going to like David's full interview. It was the most popular one I've had on the show to date. You can check it out right here. You can also subscribe to my channel here, where I release three episodes every single month. And in between those episodes, I also release other kinds of tutorial videos where we talk about scaling applications, web performance, using different kinds of really nice services. So go ahead and subscribe here and check out the interview here. Thanks for watching.